Hello, everyone out in the world. My name is Janelle Codiani. I'm the executive director at ATAC, Downtown Arts and Music, formerly known as Amazing Things Art Center in Framingham. Um, we are coming to you from all over right now um, for our last process talk of the season. Uh, this series is a lecture series from artists and uh, all kinds of creators talking about a part of their process that's interesting to them. Those of you who have been with us here before, you know this is one of my favorite things that uh, has come to our program in this time. And so I'm, I'm excited that it has lasted all the way through the season. I'm very excited to bring it to you in person and streamed next season. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have you all here today. Um, if you're interested in other things that we're doing, we are absolutely doing a couple of summertime things, including our summer movie series, Reels, Meals, and Automobiles, where we will be screening four family-friendly films uh, at the Plymouth Church in Framingham in the month of July. So please go to our website and check that out um, and sign up for a newsletter so you can find out what we're planning for the fall. Uh, a lot of really exciting and fun stuff. This talk today, the way that it will work, is um, Colin, who's with us today, will give a talk. And if you are here in the Zoom um, or you're out there in Facebook, you can ask questions in the chat and I will relay them into the talk. Um, and you can text, I'll be monitoring my phone. So if I'm looking down, I'm not bored. I'm just making sure everybody in Facebook is included. Um, and, and that's it. Um, so thank you again for being here with us. And thank you, Colin, for your talk tonight. And I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, hi. Um, my name's Colin. I am currently living in Boston doing my graduate work at Boston University um, in this guy, uh, Bass Ramon Orchestral Performance, which has been weird to say the least uh, when we can't perform orchestrally yet. So <laughs> um, that's been a time. But um, I did my undergrad at the University of Rhode Island um, and originally from Massachusetts, so a little bit of homecoming for, for grad work. Um, today, I really wanted to touch on something that I haven't really seen specifically. Um, I mean, coming from the orchestral musician background, I haven't seen this in our community as much. Um, and as creatives in general, um, I think we've seen just recently an acknowledgement of, hey, artists are people and we experience burnout and uh, these things happen, but I haven't seen a whole lot of like, okay, but then what? Um, so I have a little bit of a solution that I have figured out um, and I wanna share um, and a little bit of a presentation. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, and there we go. Um, I won't do full screen because the yellow is pretty intense. <laughs> but so I really wanted to um, talk on creating holistic and sustainable approaches to creativity. And the first big question for all of this, um, at least in my own mind, is uh, why? Why talk about this? Why get into this? Um, I think as creatives, we haven't necessarily as creatives in, in the working field and trying to make a living with what we do, we haven't necessarily all acknowledged that we can't pour from an empty cup. I think we're all give, 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 give all the time. We don't necessarily do a whole lot to replenish ourselves. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that you are part of the material that you utilize for your craft. You know, your work has a little bit of you. It takes your effort, your thought, your love, your soul, to create stuff. Uh, and the best products always use the best materials. So if you're part of the material, you have to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Um, and this little, little thing here, um, we talk about, you know, at least in, in the music world of like, there's music and there's craft of like saying something from your soul, but also you know, scales, intonation, technique, stuff like that. So before we're an artisan, we're an artist. And before we can be an artist, we have to be a human being. Um, and I think that's why getting into stuff like this is so important and, and needed. Um, and also, if nothing else, just from the practical standpoint, 
potential minus interference equals performance. We have, all of us have the potential to be great artists, but we don't always know how to get rid of the interference that's in front of us. And the interference always takes away from what we do in our product of, you know, the, the art that we create, whether it be audio, visual, what have you. And here are some of the, the biggest pitfalls I see or have seen in my, my short career as a, a grad student um, so, so far. Um, the biggest thing up top is, is linking our craft or, or the perception of our work to our worth as people. You know, I become that cracked note in the performance. I become the last note that I played, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and I think it's, it's, well, I know it's important <laughs> to recognize that who you are is not what you do. You know, myself as a human being is not tied to this instrument. It's something that I do, and it's something that I work at every day, but it's not who I am fundamentally. And I, it takes a lot of, or it took me a lot of work to, to separate that. Uh, for a long time, it was, you know, I became my last performance. If it was a bad performance, you know, just beating yourself up day in, day out for it. Um, and, and moving on, I think it's also the perfection over progress. You know, we're obsessed with getting everything exactly right. Obsessed with everything has to be right in its place. Uh, but realistically, we're climbing a mountain that has no summit or a trail with no end or whatever um, metaphor you like best. There is no end for what we do. It's all just a path. Um, and perfection, it's important to realize and remember that perfection is only a concept. You know, it's not an end goal. It's not something that you can be. It's just this intangible thing called perfection. You know, there are no perfect artists. Each one of us has something that we need to work on. Each one of us has our strengths, our weaknesses. We're a mixed bag of everything. Um, and on top of that, rest is a requirement, not a reward. I think in the, the world of creatives, um, Janelle, you mentioned the, the production team as well. Um, it's, we're so obsessed with, you know, work, 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 work. If we don't feel the burnout coming, then we're quote, not working hard enough, or we have to be quote, perfect or quote, good enough, whatever that means. But we have to treat ourselves like athletes. You know, it's all a cycle of effort and recovery. And on top, or um, moving on from that, is ignoring your body. You know, your body will tell you when something isn't right, whether that's suddenly I'm falling asleep all the time, suddenly that third double shot isn't hitting quite as well as it used to. Like, these things, it's your body telling you that, like, hey, take some time. You know, things need to recover. Um, preserving a routine, you know, practicing every morning, doing X amount of hours, X amount of work, or I always work this hard in the morning, I always stay up, so if something happens in my schedule, I still have to do this. Um, preserving the routine is not more important than preserving your health. And that is the message of what I want to convey tonight, of, you know, we are human beings that are doing this thing that people enjoy. If art is a reflection of our soul, and if we're just killing ourselves to do it, is it worth it, you know? To make it worth it and to really make it as fulfilling as possible for both the artist and the viewer, the listener, whatever, that nourishment needs to happen. Um, and it needs to happen as a pattern of behavior, which is where the negative self-talk comes in. Your brain hardwires what you tell it. Every time you say, oh, I'm such an idiot, your brain hears that and goes, okay, I'm an idiot, classified, categorized. You know, I suck at this becomes internalized and wired into your brain. And your brain 
can internalize everything except the word don't. And I'm sure we've all experienced this. You know, when you're on stage or trying to do something with fine motor skills and you go, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up. Nine times out of 10, we mess up because your brain skips right over the don't and goes, mess up. Um, and I'll get more into how we can maybe start to change that pattern a little bit of instead of just, oh, I suck or I should be able to do this. Changing that reaction to more of an additive thought process. Um, and another thing on top of that is, you know, comparing yourself to other artists or creatives or your work to other work, especially on social media. And social media is just a curated gallery that's been personalized that people want you to see. You know, even my own page isn't everything. And everyone's pages isn't everything. It's just the good and the, the cheerful that we want to portray to the world. Uh, but we can also look at that and go, this is this person's life. Everything that they do is so good, why can't my life be like that, you know? Um, and it, it can get heavy. And I, I think that is where the shouldisms come in. You know, I should be making art this quality. I should be playing like this. I should be able to do this. Uh, and this is where we can sort of start to change that pattern. The word should, I it like instantly hurts my brain because I've said it so many times. <laughs> but um, over time, and all of this is you know very much a process. Um, all of this, you know, it's not gonna be snap a finger. Okay, I have a different thought pattern. You know, I don't want to make it seem like that because it's not. Um, but if you can catch yourself and go, okay, instead of I should be able to do this, correct it and say, you know, something like, looks like I have some more things to keep working on and have that additive thought in something actionable instead of just, I should be able to do this. I'm not good enough. You know, that negative self-talk gets wired in. So if we keep correcting it to actionable plan, refrain from negative self-talk, help look for solutions, and looks like I have some more things to keep working on implies that there is still good within the work that you see instead of just, I should be able to do it better. You know, that is so much more of an absolute that I, I don't like to get into. Um, so what are some of the actionable steps that we can take? Um, now some things that uh, nourish the physical, mental, emotional side of us and also foster rest and sustainability would be try to schedule a rest day. I know it's not always possible and it's not always going to be, you know, the same day a week and that's fine. But, um, a goal, try to schedule a rest day, you know, one day a week, try to just step away from the work. You know, it's even with, with this guy over here, I always, at least one day a week, just put it away, get some mental distance, whatever. I love, to play, but also, just like I said earlier, just like athletes, we have to operate on a cycle of effort and rest. You know, the, the Olympians and the athletes, we see them exercising all the time and working out and all these like workout videos, but they don't live at the gym. They have lives, just like we should have lives. Um, and again, rest is a requirement, not a reward. If nothing else, <laughs> that, that quote, I want, tattooed or on a neon sign in everyone's vision. You know, rest is a requirement, not a reward. Um, and also the free time in our schedule doesn't mean always this time is available to be booked. You know, I always say that free time isn't free. But just because I'm not you know, at my job or practicing doesn't mean that that time isn't being used. Um, and also what I've started to do, um, and I would suggest to everyone try this at least for a couple days. Um, I can't recommend this enough uh, to have a gratitude journal. You know, whether that's part of the morning routine before you go to bed, um, any part of the day, just take a few minutes, just write down some random things that you're grateful for. It can be as small as like, I'm grateful for this glass of orange juice I had this morning. 
Or it can be as profound as like, I'm grateful I get to wake up every day and play the trombone. It can be whatever. Um, I have found it's very difficult to go down the path of burnout and be unhappy when you consistently cultivate gratitude, when you're in that thought pattern of, of positivity. Um, and off of that, I always try to find inspiration. You know, every day, take a little bit of time, try to go back and do something that reminded you of why you started. You know, it's always going back to like the, the why I do this. Um, and also, while you're doing that, you could find inspiration in other places. And I highly recommend looking for inspiration in other places. Um, like for me, for example, of course I'm inspired by other musicians, but I'm also inspired by artists. I'm inspired by athletes. I'm inspired by random people in my life. I'm in inspired by friends, family, relatives, all of that. Um, and earlier I mentioned that you can't pour from an empty cup. And with finding this inspiration, what fills your cup? What replenishes you? You know, what refills that battery pack emotionally, physically, mentally? And always keep going to that. Because you know, we love to give as artists, but we have to have something to give. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, actively try to make self-talk positive and, and additive instead of subtractive. And instead of don't mess up, if you feel yourself going down that path of like, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up, try to correct it if you can think of it in the moment. I know, you know, it's, it's all a very long process to this. Um, try to correct it to something like, make sure to really concentrate on something specific. So your brain has something to latch onto instead of just the vague concept of don't mess up. Um, and on the musician end, you know, instead of playing, you know, don't play out of tune, that, okay. Like, <laughs> try to correct it to like, pay attention to the intervals, are they sitting correctly? You know, make it more actionable, additive, positive sort of thing. Um, and something that's really helped me in the past, and I still have it on my music stand now, still refer to it every day, is a self-talk sheet. It's from a man named Pat Sheridan, um, international tuba soloist. Yes, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> um, has an MBA, basically talks like a life coach. He's a wonderful human being. Highly recommend checking him out if, if you have time. Um, and he, during master classes, he has the audience do this. And I fell in love with it. Um, where you fold a piece of paper um, vertically, hot dog. Um, and on the left side, just jot down, you know, five to start with. Five negative things, you know, one to two words each that, you know, teachers, friends, colleagues, whoever in your life said to you that, like, genuinely stuck, like were negative, hurtful, things that you still carry with you now. You know, an example would be like, you suck, you're horrible, incompetent, selfish, weak. That was on the left side. And then on the right side, five positive things. Same thing, teachers, friends, colleagues. You know, what are some things that still stick with you today that really bolstered your self-esteem, that really made you feel like you were on the right path, that had a positive impact in your life? You know, an example would be, you know, inspiring, strong, beautiful, amazing, role model, all of these things. And, you know, take a look at, examine both sides, um, and then put it away. Keep it where you do your work, whether that's, you know, in the studio, at your office, in the practice room, on the music stand, what have you. Uh, when you find yourself, you know, in that, that little moment of clarity, when you're in that, like, cycle of self-talk of, like, God, I'm such an idiot, like, that sort of thing, if you catch yourself in that, take a look at the negative side of the paper and acknowledge that like, this is becoming a rehashing of all the negative things that have stuck with you in the past. And really it's just going back to that mental space and regurgitating what people have told you. But you can also regurgitate the positive things that people have told you as well. Look at the positive half of the sheet. Acknowledge that 
people have also said those things to you. And that the anger and frustration, passing feelings, and you've made a positive impact, just spend a minute or two, just look at those you know, attributes, those character traits. That's your character. You know, you've made a positive impact. Look at that deep breath, maybe a shower and a sandwich. Go back to, to, to what you were doing. Try to like get back into that space and then, you know, fresh eyes basically. Um, yeah, that, that has helped me really more than in anything. So I, I can't recommend that enough, but, um, that is basically my talk. That was really, <laughs> that was really, um, I definitely felt a lot of those things personally. Um, I'm sure that lots of the folks listening do, um, cause as you said at the top, it's kind of part of the it's a feature. It's a feature of the, uh, mm. the world, I think. Um, I think too, especially after this year where artists and creators have found themselves either out of work, scrambling to present their work in a different way, you know, finding, finding in some cases in a completely different industry, um, mm. to support themselves and their families. Um, you know, there's, there has been this, um, pressure, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if this resonates for you, but, um, there's this like pressure to be supremely innovative, you know, and, and to find this incredibly, like to take this opportunity to find this incredibly new way to connect with people and present your work. And, um, you know, as a facilitator, I've definitely, I have definitely felt that pressure um, myself, you know, personally, you know, in leading the organization as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, I think probably as we, as we come out of this period of time specifically and have a moment to like sort of catch up to ourselves. I, I bet a lot of people are feeling that burnout. A hundred percent. You know, I, I think one of the, the most like pet peeve questions that, that I've been asked over the you know, past year and a half is how are you using this time? You know, <laughs> it's like, do we have to be using it? You know, this is a, such a moment of societal trauma. You know, no one's going to blame you if you put the horn away for a week. No one's going to blame you if you put down the, the paintbrushes for a week. Yeah. It's an intense time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, this entire time I've, I've attempted to think of like, what are the things, what are the things worth keeping? I think in similar, in similarity to a gratitude journal, like there's always something worth keeping, right? Mm. Usually there must be something worth keeping. Um, and I think like, really simple ones are the, the increased accessibility that we've learned to accommodate for, you know, by doing things remotely and streaming, right? So there's like, that's worth keeping. There's an entire community mm -hmm. can access, right? All of that. Um, but I think like normalizing the whole life that people are living, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for, for myself as a single mom, I've had like multiple professional Zoom calls just like children's faces asking about this question, you know, and I think pre-pandemic, that show of just your humanity, you know, would be really considered unprofessional and maybe mm. people still feel that way, but there's this opportunity to um, erase some of those shoulds, right? Like right. being able to compartmentalize your life in this way. So I think that's, that's really, really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that I don't like just basically talk about myself because all <laughs> things resonate so deeply for me. Um, but I'm curious. So <laughs> in the spirit of attempting not to do that, I'm going to say this. Um, I find myself whenever I have this new thing that I'm like, okay, yes, I'm a whole person. I should probably take care of myself. Rest is probably required and all of these things. <laughs> I immediately, I immediately make that into its own project that I'm accomplishing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if you have come across that in yourself. I don't know, you know, it might not be a trait that you share, but I'm like, okay, here's what I'm going to do every single Sunday. I'm going to like not do this and here are the rules and here's the structure. And now I'm, I'm accomplishing this project of rest. 
right. which intellectually understand is not actually the thing. Um, right. Now, I, I find myself doing or having done that same thing and even slipping back into it. You know, I have just started coming back after, you know, a, a couple of weeks off the horn just to like have a reset, have like, you know, I found myself slipping into like the, okay, you know, I started a new job in the city, practicing, just moved into the city, like all these things. Okay, now I'm going to like actively relax, which, you know, not sometimes it, like going out for a spa day, going for a walk, going for a hike. I would say that's actively really relaxing, but the way I was doing it was, you know, I will, you know, schedule all of these things and like made it a big, big production. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think we're living proof that the progress in that field isn't linear. You know, it's, it's okay to, to slip and it's okay to go back. I mean, it's an ongoing process and it's, you know, it's building off of each other, but in the way, you know, when you pour honey, you know, it, it falls and it coils and it, it's all of these things. It's not necessarily like a skyscraper, if that makes sense. It does. Um, <laughs> you know, I, especially now, you know, it's over the past year, you have so much time to just either devote a day to sitting in front of the computer, doing all of these things, sending emails, trying to make this whole situation work, or days on end where it's, you know, watching The Office for the 13th time, or, you know, and it's such an extreme. I have found with, with people that I've talked to over the past year, where it's like either completely overwhelming or soul-sucking boredom. Mm. And neither one is very fulfilling. Um, and I, it seems like a pendulum, really. And it's trying to find a spot to just keep the pendulum still in the middle, but it's always going to start swinging again. Yeah, I think... It seems it seems cliche to say, but it is really challenging to um, to find that balance. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think too like of in in leadership positions, those of us who are privileged enough to be to be in leadership positions of of figuring out how to foster an environment that actively works against that inclination of just being like pushed to breaking point all of the time usually for like not enough money. I don't know how much money is worth your mental breakdown, but I haven't quite seen that that level of fun. Right. You know, but I couldn't tell you exactly what it is. Um, you know, and you know, I think like, as I look at the organizational structure, you know, of ATAC, and we hope to even for our staff positions have creative people employed with us um, because many of us need, you know, we need, semi or non-creative, non-directly creative jobs as well, usually, you know, like that's definitely common um, and like not a sellout thing or anything like that. It's just like another way to survive. Um, and we are, we are really working on a structure where we're doing our full time is a little bit less than 40 hours um, mm -hmm. to allow for at least some time for that regenerative creative process and for people to stay involved in their creative life. We think that would enhance the organization, but also like, it's really hard to mm. be creative without regeneration time, you know, Definitely. like the quiet, the quiet time of your mind and thinking about rest being a requirement and not a reward is like, makes me physically nauseous, but, um, you know, just, just, because of how I'm wired, I think, but I can, I can see that that's true. And I know in my own creative experience that when I, when I don't have time to not be thinking about a task that needs to be completed, I like it. I don't create mm. my mind, you know? Definitely. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's also important um, to, to recognize that like, it's not, a character flaw to do things that aren't in our field. You know, it's, we, you know, at least in the, the musician world, there's this stigma of like, well, if you have like a day job or if you have a career that's not all devoted to this craft or all devoted to the field that you're in, then somehow, like you said, like 
a sellout or you know some sort of like not good enough type thing it's like i specifically went for jobs or applied for jobs that weren't in music just so like they're a foil for each other yeah yeah you know? it yeah. can still be a passion and it doesn't have to be you know like the nine to five accounting job like it doesn't have to be i go into a cubicle and then type on a computer for a job i don't like and then i can like it's like well they can both feed each other yeah yeah i know i have a very good friend that um you know works in in database things um she's mm -hmm. an extremely talented performer and writer and she loves that other work that she does and it facilitates, you know, the other portions of her life. She's definitely a professional writer, you know, she's published and all of those things, but they, they complement each other either by literally facilitating your ability to live, you know, <laughs> like have a roof over your head or all of that, or like time away to reflect. I know what I had a job, um, at one point as the as a maintenance person for a conference center and it was like one of my favorite jobs but I was out literally in the woods building and fixing things all day and it was one of the most productive writing periods that I'd had because mm -hmm. all day my brain didn't have to like I just had space to like come up with my stories and like mm -hmm. solve writing problems mentally and then I could just sit down physically exhausted and write you know so I think that is, it's, it becomes challenging to sort of like facilitate that on your own. Um, right. and what you said about free time, not being free and like not thinking of, oh, there's a hole in my calendar. Like, what can I fill it with something to do? You, you do have something to do. And it's like, <laughs> allow your body and your mind to right. regenerate, you know? Um, right. And, and we're never, I mean, no one is ever going to get to the point where all of these plates are spinning perfectly you know we're not gonna get to this place where like okay i have now mastered rest and recovery and i am now you know physically fit emotionally well mentally completely like it there, there's never going to be this moment where like okay i have self-actualized now i can create my art for the world and it's always going to be you know this struggling game of like okay like what what needs more help? Do I need more, like, do I need to focus on mental health, you know, emotional well-being, or is my physical health slipping? Or, you know, just like you said with the, the working in the woods versus writing, it's like, okay, this is not, it's just a physically laborious job, not necessarily mentally laborious. So now once I'm met physically exhausted, now I can engage my mind and, and write and feed my art while recovering the physical side. Yeah. Yeah, versus my, my current role, which is like a little bit of both. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just things. I wonder, I'm wondering, do you, you, you may have also found yourself like a very great and supportive, um, you know, community in, in your endeavor, folks with like-mindedness, but do you ever find yourself feeling sort of the peer pressure of not being exhausted? Like, you know, of, of folks of worrying, I, and I, I've heard this from other people in our, in our respective fields of just like worrying that people will think they're not working hard enough because they're not on the verge of collapse. Do you experience that? Um, less so now that we're all in the shared experience of the global P word. Um, but, you know, 100% beforehand of like, okay, well, I need to like, you know, practice when the sun goes down, I'll sleep when the sun comes up, get a couple hours, go to class. And I was like that for a while because I thought I needed to be, you know, but here to say you don't need to be like that, <laughs> like 100%. The world's gonna spin and you're gonna make beautiful art without being like that. Um, I mean, now I, I feel like as a musician, and especially in an orchestral setting where suddenly everyone feels like they're on the spotlight for each other in the or in the like rehearsal setting or whatever, suddenly we get this feeling of like, okay, the other 111 people are analyzing me. Can't mess up, can't do this, have to be on. Uh, I am getting more to the point where I just 
tune that out. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, we're here for a reason. Each one of us got into this ensemble for a reason. Like, just play. And like, it's not a light switch. It, <laughs> it took a long time and a lot of work to do that or to be able to, you know, start to kind of do that. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, even just the atmosphere of like being in this field where, you know, the old masters, you know, devoted their lives to the craft and it's all romanticized and idealized. And, you know, uh, there's a story of Yasha Heifetz, who was this big international violin soloist back in the day in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century, really part of the 20th century. Um, and he, you know, played the solo, woman comes up to him after the concert and goes, I would give my life to play like you. And he goes, I did. It's like, great. I don't want to do that. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, maybe, maybe that worked for Mr. Heifetz. It's not going to work for me. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely, we do have this like creative culture of like the, the completely consumed, almost on the edge of madness artist mm-hmm. that, you know, there's no other focus, there's nothing else that they can possibly do. And like a little bit of digging into that finds like a trail of ruined marriages and really bad child parent relationships. And, Mm -hmm. or, you know, like also obviously like funds to facilitate that or also actual mental health, you know, crises. Um, And I think it's, I, I also think it's like really fair to acknowledge that for some of these, I don't know the, the backstory of this violinist, but um, I definitely know other artists, you know, particularly like photographers that I studied when I was younger. Um, they had, oftentimes these were men and oftentimes they had women like facilitating their mm-hmm. like nonsense, you know, they're like creative nonsense basically. <laughs> Um, and we're all like, oh my God, so incredible. Um, but they were really, those achievements and that single-mindedness was like facilitated by the labor of folks who mm-hmm. aren't in the spotlight, you know? Um, and, and you got to think too, like how delicate is that, that pattern of thought? You know, it took this person's entire life and the consumption of almost who they are but then you still need this team of people to blow smoke right in order to feed what's happening. Like I, I would much rather be not at the top, but a happy and fulfilled human being making art that I'm happy with. Like I'm, I'm completely okay with not being the best or at the top of the field or having everything be perfect. Yeah. If it makes you happy and it makes you feel fulfilled, then what else is there? Yeah, I, I had a, a friend of mine um, said one time, he, he said he wasn't, we were in a conversation, he said he wasn't making art at the moment. And I asked him if it was like hurting him, you know, and there have definitely been periods of time in my life where I was like not able for whatever reason to like be actively creating and it was like gnawing at me, you know. Mm. Um, and he was like a little bit, but you know, I know I'll come back to it and I'm not worried. He, and he said, I can, I, there are three things that I do and I like I can make art, make money and be in my partnership. And I can only do two of them at a time. And he was like, my partnership is like non-negotiable. And so sometimes he needs to be in his partnership and make money. And sometimes he needs to be in his partnership and is able to, you know, make work. And he's a graduate level artist. Like, you know, he's, he's not Mm. um, somebody who's just like a hobbyist. This is what he does. Um, And it was a really great perspective on balance that I hadn't heard. I think Mm. often we think of balance as like, here are the 10 things figure out a way to do all 10 things at, at a 10th right. and that way you can have the balance of doing them all. And he was kind of saying like, I have three main components to my life and at any given time I'm doing two of them, mm. you know? And, and it reminds me of, you know, that, that reminded me of what you were saying as far as like, maybe you don't get to be the like singular person, the singular face next to the word. Um, but you get to have like friends and, you know, right. <laughs> 
like nice dinners and maybe a hike and like your family is around, you know, and your children don't hate you. I don't know. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, all of these things cost something. Right, right. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. I think it's, it's so important to, to recognize and prioritize the non-negotiables. You know, I think too many times we get so wrapped up in what we're doing as creatives or just getting it done or, you know, just our current project versus upcoming projects for, that we forget and lose sight of like, A, why we're doing it and why we're making this art in the first place. And B, just everything in, in life. Like what, what are we living for? What are the non-negotiables? You know, we, we weren't, put on this earth to work. I'm convinced we were just put on this earth to hang out, you know, <laughs> just vibe. And if we make art, great, you know, we got to be fulfilled. Yes. You know, it's, I, I think that that's like definitely for, for viewers out there. Um, those of you who are in the, the realm of hiring artists, um, one of the things most of us have to have to do in our in our society fueled by capitalism is make money like it's mm -hmm. generally a non-negotiable component for many of us and it's probably not the one that we feel most passionate about in and of itself um and so it's it's definitely a good reminder that art is valuable you know and mm -hmm. when you're asking when you're asking for that contribution in your life you should pay for it you know and you should yeah like to those to those purchasing things or wanting to consume art you know, it, it does come at a cost, either financial or personal, you know, for it to right. be. Yeah, and you know, off of that, you know, putting a monetary value on something so subjective is tough to begin with, because it's like, is the monetary value what I think I can get for putting this art out there? Or is it, I am touched and moved so deeply by what I created, it's this valuable to me, and if you think so too, pay for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really it's a really tricky model for sure. Like <laughs> the person on either end of it. I mean, they're definitely like, you know, I for a long period of time I felt like a like I was undervaluing myself by not really wanting to make money through my writing. Um, but I was I was really I really didn't want to because I was afraid that it would make me a little more calculating with my mm. creative choices than I, that I wanted to be in like less curious, um, you know, and that's like, that's a choice that then requires me to, you know, right. serve my life in another way. Um, but the, all of those choices, all of those balances, you know, they, mm. know. it's, it is really, it is really hard when everything is like down to a monet, like everything's down to a number. <laughs> it's like right. just, system that we have makes it kind of tricky uh, yeah. even in thinking yeah. about time. One of my um, good friends and someone I've worked with for, for a couple of years now, one of, you know, some things that she says, I just like internalize, take with me and they're quotes that I just bring with me forever. Um, and one of them is rest is requirement, not a reward. Another one is you have something to offer and nothing to prove. Mm. You know, I think as creatives or people in the creative fields, it's very much like, a, okay, this is a, a proving ground or like I have to constantly prove myself not only for self-validation, but for the validation from other people. It's like, that's not what art is. Yeah. You know? um, or that's not how I see it, at least. You know, for me, my art isn't for validation. It's to it's like I said earlier, it's a reflection of of the soul, yeah. and it's an emotional message. You know, and it's I forget who said this quote, but like art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. You know, it's this boat rocking emotional like raw thing. Why do we feel like we need to be validated for it? You know, it's I think part of it is because we have to be so vulnerable to make art the way we truly want to, that it's scary. Yeah. You know, and we're obsessed with having this, you know, hard shell up front and hide the sort of the soft person underneath behind the shell. Um, and, and 
another one of my friends who I've been uh, working with for, for a while, um, he's also a trombone player, um, he and my other friend always talk about having a soft front and a hard back. You know, have that vulnerability ready to show the world, but still have that shell behind you to fall back on. You know, because when the shell breaks, when it's in front of you, you have nothing. Yeah. But when it's behind you, you still have it to fall back on. But you're also able to show the world, like, with the vulnerability that you want. Yeah. That's 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 an interesting inversion of I think how we how we often think about it. That's really interesting. Um I think about the vulnerability required in making art a lot and you know and how at the same time I think that you know we're like as far as having to prove ourselves and the amount of work, emotional work it is to believe that, you know, and mm. how much that is robbing you of your peace, uh, basically, <laughs> um, is the is this idea that like, we have this like, cultural skin of seeing art making as indulgent, mm. unless you, unless you make it, whatever that means, right? right. Similarly, like, we love the story of like the people who sold everything they owned and like now they farm coffee in Costa Rica. Like we right. love the yeah. story of these like wild extreme gestures if they work. If they don't work, we're like, what a waste of the mm -hmm. machine those people are, you know? And I think that artists attempting to live a, like a, a, a balanced life you're dealing with this idea that like making art is indulgent and somehow robbing the rest of the culture from your labor um, and mm -hmm. your contribution while the vulnerability and creativity is like revered and people will often say like, I, you know, I would never be able to do that or it's so amazing that you can do that and blah, 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 you know, all of those things. Um, and it's like a lot of mixed, it's a lot of mixed mm -hmm. signals from the culture. So this courtship is like filled with a ton of mixed signals, you know? Right. You know, and as artists to begin with, we're doing something, at least in our society, controversial. You know, we're not getting the nine to five. We're not, you know, getting paid bi-weekly, consistently, saving up for the 401k. Like, it's not this controversial, like, 1950s American dream or whatever yeah. thing. It's like, we're devoting our schedule, part of our vulnerability and part of our time, effort, whatever, to do this thing that we find fulfilling or that we want to share with the world. And that's where, you know, this unconventionality and, you know, controversial gesture comes in. It's like, it's going to be mixed no matter what we do, whether or not, you know, it's just something on the side and then the, the hardworking art community sees this as like, oh, we threw stuff away and we didn't work hard enough. Or if we do the big grand gesture and something crazy, it's seen, you know, almost equally weird from both sides of like, how could they just throw this away? Or they had, they were comfortable. Like what? Yeah. So, I mean, at that point it's like, well, then what do we do other than just what fulfills us? Yeah. You know, the only constant in all of that is what we think. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of, um, you know, you know, like in, in Buddhism, um, and I'm not a Buddhist, so I'm paraphrasing probably terribly, but, you know, there's a difference between like the person that gives up their life and goes and lives in a monastery and they're following the precepts all of the time and that's their full existence and then there's like another set of rules for the people who are like have a family and and run mm. town businesses like they they need to follow different uh, they need to practice those values in a different active way because they're mm. they're part of the society differently um and i you know thinking about art making um, in the context of having, you know, Colin, it's really a different way to think about the structure of, 
of being an artist because it is very countercultural. What you're talking about, you know, as far as making sure that person could be a whole life, it is really, really different. Um, mm. You know, we have this really all or nothing grand gesture or failure you know, perspective right. <laughs> on it. And so being in the practice of your creativity and having your family, having your partnership, you know, having potentially another job that serves your community differently, but mm -hmm. isn't related to your art. Um, it is, is a tricky place to sit in when the work is very often undervalued and you're constantly trying to prove yourself. And if it's like, is that a hobby then? Are you not legit? You know, there's right, this whole right. other sort of mental game to, to engage in there. Um, mm, and that comes with its own, you know, nonlinear set of, you know, evolutionary development yeah. you know, with, with the thought pattern. It's like, I, at points have been like, okay, well, do I just, you know, turtle up and just do my own thing and keep my head down and not be a part of either community or do I like try to reach out and do these things and like I believe in my message you know I, I believe that we can be human beings have a life while also creating fulfilling art for both myself and for you know people on the receiving end of the art so do I reach out and like try to spread that message and that's what I've sort of begun to do. And then with this talk here, or it's like, I think this needs to be said. And I think, especially with, with the community of artists that we have today, and especially in times like these, with the shared societal trauma of you know, this pandemic that all of us are going through together, unique situations, but all under the same umbrella. Where it's like, okay, we have a second to just, now we're not, I mean, now we're getting back into it. But for the past year and a half, we haven't been actively, you know, hustling, grinding, like any of that, while also juggling the plates of this entire life, while also a day job, while also art. You know, we've, we've had a little bit to just like, okay, how does this feel? You know, I, I think you read somewhere that like, working musicians had a 90% unemployment rate for the past year. It's like, we've had time to, you know, there's been a lot of people quitting because they were practicing for the next gig. You know, it was just, we were practicing to work. You know, right. there are people who picked up an instrument because they finally had time and wanted to get into it and be a beginner at something. You know, explore how that felt. There were people like me, somewhere in between of like, okay, now I'm in school. I have been in this environment of practice for the rehearsal, practice for the lessons, practice to have a product. So now what? Now that I don't have anywhere to give a product to, like, what happens? And I think, you know, that mental space is really what started, like, this ev evolution of, like, what Keith started it. Like, okay, well... I'm still alive. I'm still a musician. You know, the world is still spinning, but I'm not, you know, practicing my four etudes for next week or something like that. Like, I'm not practicing for the next gig or I'm not gigging, you know, but I'm still around. Okay. This was unexpected. Now what? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I would imagine that this past year and a half was was um, very identity shaping for a lot of us, you know, as in all of the ways, but in, in very specifically in the way you, you pointed out in your talk of like how you become your work, either the successes or the failures of those. And if you don't have this, um, you know, a very a very full suited identity, you know, as like mm. as a touring musician and all of those things are, you know, there's there's a routine to it, even within the chaos, there's this, all of this structure, um, people that you meet and interact with, you're like constantly sort of pitching who you are and where you've been. And like, mm -hmm. it's a very concise, um, you know, experience. And right. 
completely without that. I know some people for the first time in like many years um, to have to reconcile with that is a whole process in and of itself. <laughs> right. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I'm thankful to have to go through this at such an early stage of my career. Mm. Because if I was, you know, 30 years into my career and then had to deal with this reckoning of who I am, I don't know if I would keep being a musician. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Yeah. But I don't have, you know, as deep of roots, you know, because I'm still in grad school, just moved to a new city, like all of these things where it's like, okay, I, I, I think for someone in, you know, especially students that are studying art and getting ready to get into the workforce when slash, you know, whenever it opens, um, they're like, we're in a unique position yeah. compared to a lot of the established artist community. And that's not necessarily a perspective that I can speak on, but you know, my own is one I can speak on. And, and if I can help you know, artists who are more established sort of navigate what we're all going through, then that would be great. Yeah. Well, one thing is for sure, we, we definitely need each other. Like, I know mm -hmm. that sounds trite, but we like clearly need each other and all of the experiences and perspectives that that we have to offer, you know, it like weaves weaves mm -hmm. a basket that that holds us all a little bit better than mm -hmm. out here alone, like trial and erroring the entire thing by ourselves. Yeah, we're um, a community for a reason. Yeah, yes, and I think you know being more upfront about the fact that you're like an actual human being that needs to sleep and drink water. Um, I think <laughs> that's us all free a little bit freer to be vulnerable um and to know that it like it doesn't all come naturally it doesn't all come in the um there are there are breakthrough moments and there are languishing plateaus you know like all of that is part of it for mm. you. um for better or for worse <laughs> it's just like it's just part of it you know mm. um and there's very little that that we could do that is worthwhile that doesn't require us to pause now and then mm. um, and collect ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am, am going to need to mute myself in a second because my I have a child that's home and she is just going to shout it away right up the stairs out there in the world. <laughs> um, and it is almost 8.30 and so pause. Um, and so um, I think that we can wrap it up. Um, this was wonderful. This was so wonderful, Colin. Thank you so much for your perspective on this and for these tips, tips and tricks, these five easy, five, five surprising tricks. <laughs> <laughs> um, just this reminder that we're all human. That we all deserve mm. self-forgiveness and some time to be and not do. Um, sure. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's totally a pleasure. If folks are catching this talk after um, and they want to they want to find you, where can they do that? Uh, the easiest place is probably Instagram um, at T-Y-R-R-E-L-L-C-A. I know a lot of double letters. <laughs> I, I didn't pick it. <laughs> uh, just the name. Um, but yeah, feel free to DM me with any questions. Um, I'm also on Facebook. You can find me there, uh, but the easiest place is probably Instagram. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being a part of this program and um, many, many, many lovely gigs in between times of rest. In your <laughs> well, thank you so much. And you as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night. Good night, you everyone. Too. Bye.